Okay, so our next presentation is from Zan Lee, and he's going to talk to us about an important distinction when somebody comes in with vision loss. Is it optic nerve or retina? Let's see. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, my name is Zan. I'm a fourth year medical student from the University of Nevada School of Medicine. And uh, I'll be talking about differentiating retinopathy and optic neuropathy <coughs> and uh, acute persistent vision loss. So that's just a picture of our Reno campus. We're pretty fortunate to uh, be able to learn in this new, new uh, newly built campus recently. Anyway, so uh, hopefully today after the talk, uh, everyone will be able to identify anatomic etiology uh, and common causes of acute persistent visual loss, as well as identify common clinical features of uh, retinal, as well as uh, optic nerve related APVL, and finally to be able to differentiate the two. So in terms of our case present, my case presentation is a 33 year old right handed man who presented with central visual disturbance his right eye, which uh, for the previous three weeks uh, it was notable he was hospitalized for severe tonsillitis and, as well as abdominal pain about six weeks prior to the event. Three weeks later, he developed abrupt onset of vision loss, described as a perfect round circle centrally uh, in the right eye and surrounded by white halos. He also notes a decreased color perception and dimmer vision when comparing his two eyes. Uh, right is, has more loss than the left. And he also notes that there was some pain pressure associated with the onset, as well as nausea, vomiting, all of which uh, had resolved by the time of the visit. Some additional history, he has a past ocular history of granular, uh, corneal granular dystrophy in, his, in himself, as well as father and paternal grandfather. And two weeks ago, he had a Humphrey Dunn, which showed a sequel central scotoma in his right eye only. And uh, recent brain MRI imaging was uh, shown no abnormalities and it was only remarkable on review system for recent stress. Physical exam was, uh, for the most part, pretty unremarkable. He did have uh, 2080 in his right eye with no, pen, no improvement on pinhole and near was J10, whereas his left eye did have improvement on pinhole and uh, near was J3. He, he had no uh, APV and uh, uh, right eye was uh, bright to dark from 7 to 4 and left 6.5 to 3.5 and pressure was normal as well as ear, uh, extraocular movements and confrontational fields. He has subjective uh, decrease in red saturation. He described it as a burgundy color when uh, looking at the cap that we often use to see whether there's some uh, vision loss. Silam was pretty unremarkable um, in term, except for the obvious corn, uh, cor corneal granular dystrophy and uh, dilated fundal exam showed Slight to delangiotactic vasculature, but otherwise healthy on the right side and the left was unremarkable except for a Bergmeister papilla. Um, macula and both eyes were difficult to visualize, but gro appear grossly normal. And everything else was, uh, in terms of stereopsis and color vision testing was normal as well. Amzer showed a central round area on the top metamorphopsia of surrounding scintillations. And uh, so this is uh, his fundal pictures, which is kind of obscure because of his corneal disease, but you can see that in his left eye, he has his Bergmeister papilla, but then the right side, for the most part, is pretty normal. There's possibly some central clearing um, depigmentation in his macula, and then there's some hyper, uh, slight hyperemia at the optic nerve, and a little bit of filling. Um, on that day, his uh, Humphrey had actually showed a central scotoma, which has changed from previous sequel central. And uh, OCT of the macula showed normal foveal contour in both eyes, but there was this mild uh, IS-OS junction irregularity in the ellipsoid region. And here's, the, here's a cut of where it is. And uh, so here's your RPE, and then there's some obscuration of the ISOS junction, which is likely causing uh, these visual symptoms for him. So general approach to um, when a patient presents with acute vision loss is uh, you have to, you're gonna get the history, but the main diagnosis is uh, starts with determining where the anatomic location is located. 
you want to figure out whether it's monocular or binocular vision. With monocular vision, typically that's going to uh, limit your locations to the globe and the, or the optic nerve. Whereas when it's binocular, it indicates vision, the lesion is at or posterior to uh, the chiasm. And as a general rule, as the lesions go more posterior neurologically, they become more congruent. And uh, macular sparing lesions like this typically indicates that the vascular event was an occipital lesion uh, because of that vast blood supply to the macula, um, to the occipital region that's supplying the uh, macula. And uh, for the general clinical approach, you want to, add, you want to do your basic uh, history. You want to ask about the associated pain, um, associated photopsia, or any float, nuance of floaters, how, how acute it was. Sometimes patients, they might accidentally close one eye one day and discover that they have vision loss and they think that's a sudden thing. And one of the most important things in terms of the view of system is to rule out um, giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis because uh, you don't want to s possibly save the other eye. And then past medical, you would definitely get neurological history because any history of tingling or uh, the like might suggest some sort of MS-related issue and then past ocular family history. And then you want to consider the patient's comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, as well as any hematologic um, abnormalities. And this is just a quick table that I found, um, which I'm not going to really talk about any of the media problems that causes this uh, APBL, but I will be speaking about these. And uh, mainly, you're going to, the initial clinical presentation is going to give you the, um, which way you're going to, which road you're going to go down in terms of which test to order. And then your tests, such as uh, fundal exam, uh, OCT, as well as visual field, are going to really give you a diagnosis. And then visual exam, like I said, visual acuity. A patient might have uh, good visual acuity, but they might have poor confrontational feel. So it's definitely important to check, basically systematically go through the entire um, physical examination and definitely look for APDs, the afferent pupillary defects. In terms of optic nerve disease, there are three classic signs, visual field defect, decreased color vision, as well as RAPD. <coughs> uh, these, when these three are present, uh, chances are it's probably a sign of optic neuropathy. Although the optic nerve itself may or may not be changed on fundal exam because it could be retrovulvar and uh, it could be something that's occurring that's not at the level of the um, retina that you're visualizing. So this is NAION. It's the most common cause of uh, sudden blindness in patients over 50. And so I just want to show like a difference between a normal disc and was typically considered as a disc at risk. In this one, you can see the cup right there, and then here, there's essentially no cup. And the theory behind that is uh, there's such a tightly packed nerve fibers that are going through that uh, lamina cabrosa that they're at increased risk for ischemic events. And then this is a diff this is a NAION, which is non-arteric uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, which is typically in an uh, older 65, 75 re, uh, age range, versus AION, which is much older, otherwise can be considered as uh, temporal arteritis. It's pretty different in terms of the presentation. Here you see hyperemia, as well as some, uh, some hemorrhages around the area, whereas here with the AION, it's a very pallid optic nerve swelling, which uh, kind of, it's pretty difficult to be able to, uh, to be able to or pretty easy to be able to differentiate these two. And then one, one of the note I wanted to make is that in uh, optic neuritis, which typically is a more slower onset, not really a sudden onset of vis uh, visual loss, is that they're both consistent with this pale optic nerve. And this is where your history is going to really help you. And you also really want to get that co uh, the review system with the constitutional symptoms of AIOM. And then as for retina, the, uh, the, the really major common cause is going to be your vascular occlusions, retina detachment, and acute maculopathy. And that's a normal fundus picture. And here, um, so this is a central retinal artery occlusion. They, it can either present with, it presents with that classic cherry red spot, um, but then uh, you can also have macular sparing secondary to the ciliary retinal arteries. 
um, or you can you may not, and then you often see this box carring of the renal vessels as well. And then BRAO, typically more infiltrant uh, sectorial ischemia, and if you're lucky, you might be able to see a uh, embolus. And the BRAOs are typically more uh, common from embolus, whereas uh, the, C the CR, the central renal artery occlusions are more from severe carotid stenosis. And here is that the renal venous occlusions. Pretty difficult to miss this one because it's often described as blood and thunder show, and uh, it's just a lot of hemorrhaging on all four quadrants, whereas similar to BRAO, the BRVO is uh, sectorial as well. And you can, on the FA, you can see that dilatation of the uh, veins. Uh, for renal detachment, patients are gonna typically come in with symptoms of photopsia, as well as new onset floaters, very similar to PVD, posterior vitreal detachment. Really the only way to definitely diagnose this is using the indirect ophthalmoscope to visualize the peripheral rena. And if you can't do that due to some sort of media problem, you can always do a PCN of the, uh, the, of the retina of the globe. And here you can see that retinal detachment right here, which will help you with the diagnosis. And then acute maculopathy was something that I kind of struggled with. I didn't really, um, it was difficult to understand, but it's a various ideology that basically anything that acute affects the macula acutely can cause this. Typically, um, you can have neuroretinitis, central serous retinopathy, as well as significant macular edema and choroidal neovascularization. Uh, common symptoms are metamorphopsia and slow recovery to light. And for the most part, physical exam is actually gonna be pretty subtle, um, not a lot of signs. The main mode of diagnosis is gonna rely on your OCT and your uh, fluorescent angiograph. And these are just some of the ones I mentioned. In terms, this is a CSR, you can see this classic uh, smoke stacking on FA and uh, as time progress. And uh, this, the, the, all of these typically occur in younger patients and uh, they could, they may do associated with pain, but they may not. Here's neuroretinitis. Uh, it's classically associated with uh, ben Bartonella infections. And uh, you can see at first, it's not really that much changing. And then at two months, there's that classic macular star pattern. And then for this, is the acute macular neuroretinopathy, very rare disease. I couldn't find a lot, most of just case reports. And uh, you can see it's pretty much, there's not really that much going on in terms of, uh, in terms of the fundus photograph. But for our differential diagnosis for our patient, it was something along this spectrum because we had that pseudocentral initial scotoma and then it kind of went into a central, which kind of tells you that somewhere in the pap uh, papillomacular bundle was uh, involved and possibly with the optic nerve as well. Any questions? I was really fast over a lot of material. Yes. Right, that's why it was kind of, in terms of the history and the physical exam finding, it was kind of difficult to distinguish because he has that, um, he had kind of some flashing and also some pain associated. And uh, typically with your ischemic events within the, for the optic nerve, they're gonna be painless. And then with the, but he said he had some pain. And then uh, besides that, he also had the decreased, he didn't have an APD, which is kind of led us towards, um, away from the optic nerve. And that's why we're basically the imaging itself comes in and you have to be able to recognize these patterns of uh, pathologies to be able to really accurately diagnose the, the problem, the disease. The red desaturation, um, from basically what I read is, um, if it, it's likely because from uh, the a slide of his OCT because it's closer to, closer to this uh, fovea where you have a high concentration of color, um, that that could be causing it. And also there was some inform previous inflammation of the optic nerve itself with some hyperemia and telangiectactic changes. So it, it really seems like it was more of a neuroretinitis picture where it started off as like some sort of inflammation at the optic nerve and kind of went over to the macula.
Yes. No, um, I actually looked through the records and uh, he was supposed to follow up and I saw a lot of the scheduled appointments got canceled. Yes. When you were talking about differentiating um, arteritic between cuff to cuff versus mm -hmm. non-arteritic, I know the pictures were very much different, but in my hand, I usually can't make that as easily as I could go to. Mm -hmm. In a lot of <laughs> <laughs> and I also I'd like to mention I'd like to thank Dr. Warner for uh, recommending this topic for me and allowing me to uh, do this presentation. Yeah, well, I actually read it. Um, if it was something along the lines of no retinitis, and um, because I forgot to mention, so he actually had a normal autofluorescence as well, and um, and his previous source in Andrew was normal as well. There's no leakage at the macula, and uh, I don't know. I don't know if it was done prior, uh, whether if it might have show leakage at the uh, optic nerve head, um, but basically the multifocal ERG. I saw a lot of um, articles that said there's, it's really just still difficult to tell even with it because it's going to be, um, I wasn't quite sure with the whole the process involved, but it had a very low sensitivity towards it. in terms of epidemiology were very similar as well. So it's, in these terms, the other thing is just that the acute macular neuroretinopathy to me when coming out of SAS is much more rare than neuroretinitis itself. Yes?
pictures I've seen were in base of Sophia said on SD or CT that you, you want to see this observation of the outer segment and that's very typical of the 